I think that we are all here, or at least we have enough people so that we can kick off this event today. Um, so me and Juan Antonio and the, the organizers welcome you, everybody. So my name is Tatiana Costa. I am uh, Innovation IP and Funding Director at uh, Alma Science, which is a uh, um, a research performing organization in Portugal and is a partner of the Reform Project. Um, and I've been working in this interface between science and uh, innovation for 12 years now, first as TTO and later as research funding advisor. Um, and so we welcome you and I, I, I pass the word to Juan to introduce himself, please. <laughs> yes, okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I am Juanan Aldunzin from CDTEC, Spain. Uh, I am chemist and I have been working on research on different fields, but uh, especially, particularly in polymers and composites. Uh, I have been working in CDTEC since uh, 2005. Okay. Okay, good. So I think that just to start, and as usual in these uh, webinars, just some housekeeping rules for, for the participants. Please keep your mics off and uh, we will have some moments for questions. So feel free to submit your questions through the chat. Okay, uh, we will try to answer them in the end of each session. session. And uh, also a, a quick note to, to notice that the, the session is being recorded. So, and then it will be um, avail made available to the community through the printed, ele printed electronic helix. Okay. Um, so Juan, I think we can move on to the first, to introduce the first speaker. Okay, thank you. Uh, to kick off today's event, I'm delighted to invite Kais Jurgens, Head of Membership Development at uh, CrowdElix to introduce the printed electronics edicts hosted on the CrowdElix Open Innovation Platform. Please, okay. guys, take the floor, please. All right. Thank you very much for the introduction and for having me here. It's great to be here presenting to you all. Uh, as mentioned, I'm going to give you a quick look at the Printed Electronics Helix community, which has been established on the platform as part of the project, as part essentially of the impact section for the project. So this will be a community. It is a community. It's a brand new community that will focus on things like innovation acceleration, uh, IP generation, market uptake, uh, eventually financing and promoting the key exploitable results stemming from the project. Uh, it will be a place to facilitate future collaborative partnerships in the project's area of interest going forward, and it will remain live on our platform for even a few years after the project finishes to continue to perpetuate the impact and the results of the project. Uh, I'll share my screen. I'll take you through this community over the course of the next six minutes or so, and then you can uh, ask any questions that you have. This is one of 47 communities currently live on CrowdHelix. Uh, if you are not a member of CrowdHelix, that's okay. Uh, we can add your organization to uh, the platform and you can have an individual user profile or you can type in the name of the project here where it says organization. So crowdhelix.com slash register. If you are a member of CrowdHelix, you will find your organization in the drop down menu here. You make a password and we send you a quick confirmation link and you're good to go. You can sign in. If you're part of an organization that is not a member of CrowdHelix, type in the name of the project instead, and you'll be able to access in the same way. If you access through this, you're not a member of CrowdHelix, well, you have an individual user profile just for yourself, not for your whole organization, and you can use that profile to essentially uh, follow the community and leave a comment on really any, any post across the whole platform that you see. Uh, so CrowdHelix's main focus is facilitating collaboration between academia and industry. Most of the open innovation projects stemming from our platform are Horizon Europe focused, but it's not limited to this. The other thing we're doing is showcasing key exploitable results coming out of projects. So like those coming out of your project. Uh, 
Opportunities refers to posts on our platform, usually from academics who are seeking expertise. We're nearing 13,000 individual users, our members are universities, SMEs, research centers, startups, NGOs, policymakers, large corporates, basically anyone participating in the European research area, and they are based in 57 countries. Uh, these are opportunities to collaborate across all areas of interest on Crowd Helix, but today we're focusing on the printed electronics Helix. To access this part of the platform, then you can click on Filter by Helix right here and scroll down and you find the community. Now the platform is recommending corresponding communities that might be of interest to you as well, uh, based on your areas of interest on Crowd Helix. So uh, we can filter by those as well. I'm selecting materials, which is linked maybe circular industry or manufacturing are communities that are linked as well. We're going to filter by these areas of interest and see the most recent opportunities to collaborate that have been uh, added to the community in these areas. And some of them are from organizations that are part of the reform consortium, for example. Others might be opportunities to collaborate for upcoming uh, Horizon Europe um, opportunities. And then eventually we will see key exploitable results coming from the project. So let's visit the community itself. We have opportunities here. Eventually we ha will have key exploitable results to showcase. Um, if we want to take a quick look at an example of an opportunity, here is one that was added by a company called Zaz Ventures. They added this to the printed electronics, Pathfinder and materials communities, meaning every single person on our entire platform subscribed to those three. They've already been notified that Nadej is looking to collaborate, that they're seeking a partner to join a consortium they are putting together. They're going to submit a proposal for an upcoming uh, Pathfinder uh, deadline. Uh, Nadej has left some expertise tags on her post, and these are important for a few key reasons. For example, first, we have ecological impact or electronic devices. We can search the whole platform with this keyword. Every post, every organization, every department or faculty, every individual user, and even results coming out of projects. They go into some detail about the consortium and what they'd like to achieve. You could reach out to them. Uh, Nadej has left her email address. Otherwise, you can leave a comment, a moderated comment on the post, and you can leave a comment even if you're not part of a CrowdHelix member organization. It's moderated first, but you can leave it there. You can share the opportunity with a colleague uh, if they're on CrowdHelix, and if they're not, you can send them an invite, and you can send a direct private message to the platform. So these are just ways in which you can engage with posts coming through the printed electronics helix. If we view the community itself, uh, this is the landing page, basically some background, some scope. What is the community focused on and why was it created? Essentially, it was created to support the reform project. Uh, here are the early, essentially major players who are really keen to be seen as major players in this area in the printed electronics helix. Uh, today is the launch event. Any other events will show up here. A link to the project website. Uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Valeria Pulieri, is the manager of this community. So far, we have mapped 22 individuals from 11 countries onto this community. Now, the purpose of today's session and going forward, we want to grow this community to be something bigger, something with hundreds or even thousands of individual users. Some of the communities on CrowdHelix are populated with over you know, two to 3,000 researchers looking to collaborate. And that's our goal for this community as well. So we invite you to sign up one more time. If you haven't done it yet, go to crowdhelix.com slash register. If you're a member, you'll find your organization in the drop down menu here, like LATAT. If you're not, then uh, you should be able to type in the name of the community or printed electronics. Uh, we'll make sure that works in a moment and you can access. If not, we can just share a post with you from the platform and you can access that way. So uh, stay tuned. We'll be uh, getting to work, making sure everyone is receiving a post so they can access. If you have any questions, let me know. I think I have about 30 seconds left. Okay, no questions. Okay, great. Well, thanks everyone. Have a great session and a great rest of your day. Okay, thank you, Case, Bye. for your great introduction to the Elix. So I think we can move on to the second session of the day, okay, which is the state of the art in printed electronics. There will be some time in the end of the session for questions and answers. So again, I reinforce, please leave your questions in the in the chat. 
Um, I will now introduce uh, Dr. Yang Tong Li. I'm sorry for the bad pronunciation. Um, he's Associate Professor in Printed Electronics at KTH and Co-Chair of the IEEE Electronic Pack Packaging Society Nordic Chapter. His research, research interests uh, includes inkjet printing and 3D printing of graphene, 2D materials, and conduct, conducting polymers for electronics and energy storage applications. His recent efforts are also extended to the developments of versatile graphene inks for industry applications, including heat conductions, water purification sensors, and energy storage. So, Yang Tong Li, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the nice uh, uh, introduction and uh, uh, provide this opportunity for, for me to introduce our research here about printed electronics at the KTH. Um, yeah, if you find my research interesting, absolutely you can uh, get my email and the phone number here. Where we can uh, conduct and uh, to discuss further. Absolutely, you can also find me in Karate Helix very soon. I think I will have uh, my new account there. And uh, at the KTH, we are trying to develop a different kind of uh, inks and uh, including carbon nanotubes, graphene, MS2, this kind of 2D materials, and also mixing. I will also focus on the development. And we also focus on some conducting polymer like uh, polyaniline and C dot PSS, this kind of inks, uh, also including some uh, polyelectrolyte inks, PSSH, that's uh, other inks uh, could be used for uh, both the inject printing and uh, also 3D printing. Uh, specifically, it's uh, direct ink writing. Yeah, we use this Felix uh, bio printer uh, for 3D printing and also this uh, Dimatis inject printer for uh, uh, inject printing. Uh, in practice, we can print uh, different kinds of materials and on different kinds of substrate. And uh, through indirect or maybe transfer printing process, the print pattern can also be passed to almost whatever kinds of substrate they are including. You can see some living plants, also fruits, and also 3D surface. And uh, very recently, we focused on uh, printing uh, functional materials on uh, paper and to enhance its sustainability. Um, yeah, here you can see uh, we put uh, pretty much our focus uh, uh, research on uh, print ultra fast micro supercapacitor. This is one uh, component for this reform project, and we are able to print a large scale uh, uh, micro supercapacitor based on graphene or based on P dot. And for P dot uh, printing, we can directly print on paper substrates without any metal, the devices could be charged or discharged at a super high uh, rate, scan rate, like one watt per second. Uh, this kind of devices can be highlighted by uh, net electronics. That's a, a, a collaboration uh, research, collaborative research with the uh, side detect. Uh, we also try to develop uh, uh, some uh, three the printing process to integrate different materials into a very complicated or uh, hybrid 3D structure. As you can see here, uh, in collaboration with the uh, Tampere University in Finland, uh, we can print uh, some uh, gold nanopillar. Uh, the nanopillar has a diameter around two, one or two micrometer, but the height could be over 100 uh, uh, micrometer. And uh, around the pillar, we can print it functional materials like uh, conducting polymer, poly uh, annealing, and uh, over polymer we can print uh, electrolytes, and uh, uh, over electrolytes we can print the pitot PSS as uh, uh, another electrode. And with this cycle, we can build up a complicated 3D structure and to realize some vertical stability for uh, energy storage devices. Yeah, because for energy storage devices, it's pretty easy to scale up uh, this uh, uh, horizontal direction, but when it comes to the vertical direction, the scalability is a pretty challenge. But with this kind of uh, hybrid 3D structure that can create multiple material, it's possible to realize a vertical scalability. And then we recently also tried to uh, develop a monolithic printing method to print uh, a whole system, not only for uh, some specific devices. And we are trying to integrate uh, um, both the energy storage device and the energy house device. You can see here we have a triple electric energy nano generator. And also we have uh, uh, this uh, micro supercapacitor at energy storage. And with uh, that whole system is uh, mainly uh, be fabricated by printing. 
And then with this printer at a very small size, it's possible just to give some uh, mechanical force uh, onto this uh, energy generator. And the device is quickly uh, get out some electricity out. So we uh, try to develop uh, the printing from uh, uh, single uh, devices or components to the entire uh, system. And that's uh, our research uh, for printing electronics at the uh, KTH. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lee, for your in interesting presentation. Uh, just a couple of questions. In your opinion, what is the recent trend for printed electronics, particularly in, in academic research? Uh, yeah, uh, I would say there are quite a few. That's just my own view. Yeah, I would say the recent uh, research trend is still focus on uh, technology development. Yeah, that uh, could be still developed some high resolution and uh, printing process. Yeah, now we focus on inkjet printing that's uh, typically with a 50 micrometer uh, resolution. But, uh, so there are also many advanced uh, printing process that keep in a resolution less than one micrometer or even less than uh, uh, 100 nanometer at this scale. And for printing, um, we also think about uh, many research efforts on developing multiple materials instead of uh, one or uh, two types of things. And uh, these multiple uh, inks could be used to uh, print uh, like a uh, hybrid structure and also sometimes uh, like what we are doing, uh, develop some 3D structure to realize some uh, advanced performance. So uh, traditional printed electronics is marked as like a low cost, uh, low end. But I think uh, in the near future, people are trying to develop uh, low end, uh, high, uh, low cost, uh, high end uh, electronic uh, devices uh, with this respect. And uh, also sustainability also become a, a big uh, uh, aspect for printed electronics. Yeah, people are trying to use sustainable substrate, sustainable use, and also try to develop a sustainable applications. Yeah, like what we're doing, we people try to harvest the energy from some mechanical source and to, to save electricity, and also to uh, um, motivate the uh, battery waste. And that's uh, my view about the recent uh, change about uh, who printed the electronics. Thank you. Uh, do you have, Tatiana, any, any other question for Dr. Lee? Yeah, just an additional one that kind of goes maybe a little in line with what you have also mentioned about the trends, but what is your main research on printed electronics field? Um, yeah, my main research is focus on energy storage and uh, uh, as you can see here, also for, uh, we, we recently also involved some energy harvesting. So we are thinking about to develop some uh, fully printed uh, sustainable uh, products that could be uh, used for uh, self-charging power system yeah, for uh, sustainable electronics in the future. Um, that's uh, our main focus. But absolutely, we are also trying to make the uh, use of uh, our printed key material, that's a good thing, or pretty material uh, for some other application. Like uh, uh, we have some uh, industry partners with some small management because of the a good uh, small connectivity. And we also use the thing for anti-vector coating to the protein for the special uh, molecular structure and that uh, could be used to kill bacteria. And uh, those of these two are our uh, key. Uh, focus in my research. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Our next guest is Duncan Platt. Duncan is an electronic engineer with more than 30 years of experience in electronic engineering. He has worked at Rice Research Institute of Sweden, formerly ACREO, since 2008 and been a manager since 2017. He is currently the manager of the printed electronics unit at the acting manager of the bio and organic electronics unit, working with sustainable and printed electronics and managing the test and demonstration facility printed electronics arena. Take your floor, please. Yeah, uh, how we can take uh, green 
or greener electronics uh, from research to industry. That's the focus today. Um, our areas of research and expertise here uh, at RISE, um, we're experts in printed, flexible, stretchable, bio and organic electronics, where the focus is on sustainable electronic solutions using sustainable electronic production methods based on sustainable advanced functional materials. It's quite a multidisciplinary uh, activity. Uh, printed electronics, you need to be good at printing, curing, drying. You need to be good at inks and uh, making the materials into printable formulations and, and making them uh, over printable as well. Uh, trying to find where the electronics can be greener. Uh, so life cycle analysis and where you can contribute. We also work with devi devices such as transistors, displays, um, and we work with energy storage, energy harvesting, and we do rapid prototyping uh, and other sort of um, disciplines to realize uh, the technology. Uh, as mentioned, we are a uh, facility in North Shopping. We're on the main train line between Stockholm and Copenhagen. You can just jump off, um, well connected, Printed electronics arena, we do everything from pre-study, prototype, pilot production to sort of small scale production. We're about um, 35 people in our activities. And this is a very open facility for everyone from research to uh, SMEs to large companies, um, from local to international collaboration. Our services, both semi-automatic screen printing, fully automated screen printing, digital printing using inkjet, aerosol jet, um, and photonic curing methods, uh, pick and place assembly, uh, as I mentioned before, ink formulation, material preparation, and the characterization of the materials. They are the sort of fundamental uh, building blocks to what we are doing uh, at our facilities. So um, I hope you can see, this is a case story of um, displays. Everyone knows displays. There's, uh, of course, the OLED is the most uh, famous, I would say, at the moment. Um, but here we're coming also from a very sustainable uh, angle to displays where you can actually make displays on paper. And we realize electrochromic displays, for example, on paper or recycled plastic, or it could be on other materials. You could put even on textiles. And this is now being commercialized. Um, so we've taken a, a deep tech technology, which is based on research, first at Lynch Shopping University and then by RISE, from fundamental to applied research. And now after um, many years of developing the materials and the, the stack and the technology, um, we are licensing that to the company Invisible which also involves technology transfer and scaling up different kinds of processes uh, to come to full roll-to-roll -roll production, which in this case started in July uh, during the summer, and the products are now coming out onto the market, um, which is very exciting. And this is also a key thing for printed electronics, a deep tech uh, technology. Um, so the path to market is long. It's both material development and then applying the materials. So it takes time this uh, you have to be aware of to really raise the, the TRL. Um, another case story, um, a spin-off from our activities here again uh, in the town of North Shopping at the University in Rise. Um, a patterning technology where we are using already uh, coated foils, which can be aluminium or copper or copper clad aluminium or other materials where instead of using chemical etching, we use uh, mechanical milling. So a purely mechanical patterning process where you can achieve line widths and line spaces of 100 microns with uh, exceptional quality and repeatability, where the throughput is uh, 30 meters per minute. And this is um, also a technique where you can see that the material removed, you just, um, I would say, use a, a suction. Uh, so there's zero waste. You can use that uh, aluminum or whatever you can either sell it or reuse it, and um, you have uh, no waste. Um, and this, uh, if you can apply this sort of technology, um, where here we are selling the machines to the tier one suppliers that actually produce the, the circuit boards um, on this foil, um, compared to conventional electronics, according to a study made by Fraunhofer in a particular case, you reduce your carbon footprint by 98%. So this is very interesting technology. And of course you can print on top of this and do uh, added functionality combining this for printed electronics. 
Um, this is a, a, a fundamental technology which has actually been an enabler for battery management systems and electric vehicles for the sort of management systems. So this is very exciting for uh, automotive industry. Um, also, to help break down the threshold um, for uh, electronic engineers who perhaps aren't so used to printed electronics, we have a, a sensor kit, which is plug and play. Um, just contact us where we help. Uh, we have a, a simple node, um, which um, I hope my battery doesn't run out. A simple node, which uh, connects um, to any kind of sensors. We have a sensor kit, which you can hire or borrow or buy, and you can test sensors, all different kinds of sensors, just directly connected to this Bluetooth node. Also, you can test energy harvesting solutions. So you can have zero energy IoT straight away. Um, also, for collaboration, we are hosts of Digital Cello Center. We're looking to internationalize. There is ground research. So we can work on a power paper, energy storage, where we can achieve now one farad per square centimeter on uh, power paper solutions for supercapacitors and capacitors. And then uh, to do some adverse, because we love to collaborate here and everyone online, uh, I know many of you and we collaborate with many of you. Tatiana is one of the partners, of course. So uh, let me advertise the Emerge project. So completely free, um, you can apply for a project. You can test it with any of the sites here, including uh, Alma Science, so where, Alma, uh, where Tatiana is, uh, or where we are in North Shopping, or Dresden, or Joannium, or all these fine institutes soon and over. Um, you can do this free of charge, uh, even travel and accommodation paid to test and try your idea out. It's for researchers, for SMEs, and for larger companies. It's not just restricted to Europe, it's from anywhere around the world. So um, don't hesitate to contact us. You have the website here in the presentation. You can find us. Um, so I would really ad strongly advise that so you can try some green electronics. And um, another one, Sustainatronics. This is built on the Libet project. It's also a one-stop shop. Here they provide also services in business uh, assessment, uh, LCA, and other things as well. So it's a single entry point as well to the printed electronics community. So you have two fantastic projects here, Emerge and Sustainatronics, where you can really get connected to the printed electronics community. And uh, I have my colleague David here as well, and myself, you have our addresses. So don't hesitate to contact us if you want to do more. Thank you. Thank you, Duncan, for your very interesting presentation and for the heads up on the Emerge project. I reinforce your message. It is a really interesting opportunity. And so please, for the audience, take a look at it and explore the opportunities that uh, are made available through the project. Um, so now we have a, a couple of questions. Um, so, Duncan, um, from your experience, um, what hinders uh, do you think that exist mm. for further in industrialization and commercialization of printed and organic electronics? Sure, uh, that's a great question. Um, so I think sometimes the printed electronics community, we're always pushing research. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to say when, when the technology is good enough. Um, um, and we need to perhaps be better at identifying uh, the industrial needs because it's quite a high expectation to expect companies to to go all in uh, on printed electronics. So you have to maybe find the right areas where it can make a, a sensible contribution to sort of break down the barriers. And the other thing I think uh, that is a hinder, it's great that there's a lot of movement on LCA and sustainability, that we are starting to get facts and figures on that to give the real figures on how this can contribute to the green transition. And maybe the other thing I think is we have to break down the boundaries between a lot of great engineers who come out of the education system on the electronic engineering side. They're a little bit scared of the material science and printed electronics is coming a little bit from physics, chemistry, material science. We have to bridge those gaps to try to um, break down the the fear of printed electronics. So um, I think that would be my answer to that question just spontaneously. Thank you, Juan Antonio. I think that we have additional questions. Yes, one, one more question. When do you expect to see the rise electrochromic display technology on the market via Invisible products, for example? 
Yeah, well, um, Invisible are in full production, as I mentioned. So I think they are actually reaching the market. So in Italy, I think you can see the results of their displays actually reaching um, reaching the market. So they're for outdoor applications. So this is also a, a great icebreaker to see if printed electronics can really cope with outdoor applications and in, in the display technology side. So that will be very exciting to see. So um I think the autumn will tell us how things are going and I uh, hope we can re-report later uh, and see if it's really hit the market and is, is doing well. So yeah, very much uh, happening now. Okay, thank you, Duncan. Uh, um, so now we are going to move on to the next, uh, uh, to the last guest of this first session, which is Dr. Maria Smolander. Uh, she is a research team leader of the Flexible Sensors and Devices uh, research team at VTT, Technical Research Center of Finland. Um, her, her expertise areas include sustainable solutions in printed electronics, in printed and hybrid electronics and photonics, development and test, testing of printed indicator and sensor concepts, as well as printable power sources. So we will move to your presentation and later on we will take some questions from the audience, so please don't be shy. Okay, hey, thanks. Thanks a lot and good morning, morning everybody. So now let's talk a little bit about some innovations in green and printed electronics, especially from the VDD perspective. And if you could please go on the next page on my presentation, that would be great. So um, indeed, uh, at least uh, at VTT, we have realized that this is a huge topic, the sustainability of electronics and green electronics. It's, it's very holistic and we need to take a holistic approach also when we are trying to figure out if something is, is sustainable and, and green and and, uh, and we have been looking at sustainability, of course, from the environmental point of view, but also we try to take into account the social and economical sustainability as, as well. And, and we also have been looking at uh, the different uh, uh, phases of the, of the product life cycle. So in design phase, you already need to think about these, these uh, items. Uh, you need to take that into account when, when selecting the materials. Also, when making the process specifications, and uh, also you need to think about sustainability when you when you are generating the use case uh, scenarios, and and also when planning the end of life strategies for the for the concepts developed. But uh, all in all, these all all items are very very heavily interlinked with with each other, and and. Uh, luckily, when we are talking about printed electronics, we are talking about energy effic efficient efficient processes. And as we heard from the presentation of Duncan, also some some very interesting possibilities in the in this this dry dry etching as well. But yeah, let's let's uh, look at some examples on the next pages if you would move on. So. Uh, we have uh, recently been developing, for instance, a uh, uh, nanocellulose. Uh, uh, film-based EGC patch. And uh, this patch has been re realized actually in two, two different variations. We have one where we have uh, all the electronics integrated on the nanocellulose-based uh, based film, the upper one uh, uh, in the pictures on the right side. And then we have another one, which is based on the modular design, where we have the electronic mo module as a reusable reusable and, and um, uh, easily uh, disintegrated, disintegrated module. And uh, here when we are using the nanocellulose as a substrate, that is on, on one hand, it is uh, enabling uh, the decreased use of fossil-based materials, and it is also decreasing the risk of microplastic release and also it can open up some new possibilities for this integration of materials uh, and components at the end of life of the product. And uh, of course, because we are implementing this modular design that is making the disintegration much more, disintegration much more uh, simpli simplified and it is enabling nicely the partial reuse. And in the picture here, we, for instance, we can see how the substrates Substrate is biodegrading in, in soil in this case, but also in, in water that takes place. 
But now, if you could move on the move to the next page. Uh, this uh, next example uh, comes from the Graphene Flaxseed Project. And uh, in, here we have collaborated together with uh, Printed Electronics Limited and Interactive Wear. And we have been developing a, a, an e-textile, a t-shirt, which is uh, meant for ETC and EMG measurement. And in this case, the uh, uh, conducting wires uh, are fully printed directly on the on the fabric, and uh, and this is combined then with the electronic module uh, again for, for for even longer use of the of the electronics, and also combined with uh, graphene play, graphene based uh, tri electrodes, and uh, uh, these tri electrodes are are uh, excellent in that sense that they don't require the use of any any um, wet gel uh, in the in the measurement uh, phase. So basically you can use them for a long time and they don't require any consumables in the in the use phase. And uh, in addition to that, they also work work very well in comparison to the traditional electrodes. But let's move uh, forward in the presentation. And uh, as the last example, I have here some uh, a collection of some um, smart labels meant for a uh, logistics chain uh, in order to make the chain more uh, efficient and, and more sustainable through that way. And these labels, which are meant for, for uh, authenticity uh, checking and also temperature logging, they have been realized with mainly with printing-based fabrication technologies and and uh, they are based on uh, paper-based or bio-based plastic uh, type of substrates. And we have also been implementing sustainable powering in this. So the first one, the authenticity label is powered by, by um, wireless uh, through NFC. And on the, on the right side, this energy autonomous temperature locker contains an energy module with printed OPV and printed supercapacitor. And, and indeed, also here we see that the use case on, it, on its part is, is uh, introducing sustainability uh, because uh, material savings in the distribution chain, for instance, in the food chain. But then uh, we, can, we can go to the last page of my presentation. So uh, <laughs> indeed, sustainability is a very co complex matter. And, and uh, here I would like to very briefly mention uh, Green tool, which is our recently published uh, very streamlined, streamlined tool for uh, sustainability assessment and assessment and benchmarking, uh, we can compare like like um, concepts what we are working with uh, with state of art technologies, and the purpose here is is to kind of um, support, for instance, material selections and design selections, so that we can already in the design phase try to make wise selection towards more sustainable solutions. And, and uh, of course, this is, this is not replacing LCA. It's kind of part of that can be based on LCA, but it's, it's a little bit more, how to say, uh, more for the design phase, because at that phase, you don't necessarily yet have all the information available. And if you're interested in this tool, it can be found in the, in the paper mentioned here on this page. But this was all from my side, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Maria, for your great presentation. Uh, one question. Is the sustainable approach already widely adopted by stakeholders in the, in the value chain? What are, what are the, the first steps to do it? Well, uh, yeah, I think I would say that many stakeholders are very interested and they have started started it's not of course fully fully implemented yet but i would say that that most most stakeholders really really are aware of the need and they they are aware of the eco design directive and and the green deal and 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 indeed pay attention and and i think that the, uh, for instance now there is a lot of lot of trials uh, for instance in replacing let's say for instance substrate material with a more sustainable alternative and and luckily also all the time more and more materials also become commercially available, which is great. Great. And definitely I think that is kind of like the first step in this in this uh, 
kind of change from change towards more sustainable printed electronics. Thank you. Do you have Tatiana any other question yeah. for Maria? So yeah, before moving to the audience questions, because we have a few for our speakers, um, Dr. Smolan, what what are the possibilities to improve sustainability at the, la the end life phase? Are there in, any particular challenges that you can point out? Yeah, I, I think that's actually the, <laughs> the the area which is most challenging challenging or at least the, at the moment I feel like that so yeah the first challenge is, is of course kind of like collecting the different waste streams that is that is maybe the major major challenge challenge there but then then uh, I think after that we need to define the um, processes for for recycling recycling and, and recovery of the materials but on the other hand And there is a lot to do in that area. But on the other hand, I think it's also a great possibility to to recover valuable materials because eventually we are we are anyway going to run out of some some uh, critical raw materials, and it's that is that's a possi possibility. But yeah, in that area, definitely work to do. Yes, thank you. Good question. <laughs> thank you. So just moving, we are going to to ask here a couple of questions from the audience, uh, but it, we need to be fast because we are running out of time. So there is one question that I think it's for Dr. Lee. What kind of applications do you have for battery applications? Uh, actually, we are not uh, making battery, we are making super capacitive. And for super capacitive, because we are trying to focus on high rate uh, super capacitive that the people can be charged, discharged at the uh, rate uh, more than one watt per second. So we uh, just try to use this super capacitive for energy harvesting. For many mechanical energy harvesting, it can give you a very high uh, wattage power. But that means that electricity will come and disappear very quickly. So in this case, we use a micro super capacitor to harvest, to, to store this kind of electricity. That's our main use of uh, the UIC. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Lee. And I think another one for Dr. Smolander. So what happens to the silver copper in the printed NFC and sensors on paper or nanocellulose substrates? Well, we we have actually carried out some some uh, experiments when we have been trying to trying to uh, kind of uh, kind of like wash wash the uh, conductive ink from the surface of the films. That has been tested. That actually worked pretty well uh, as a recovery process. Then then on paper, one one possibility is the repulping, repulping, and then then if you have Uh, kind of energy waste, um, then it's one possibility is to recover the, the metals from the ashes. So that is that is one possibility. So there are different possibilities in that area as well. Thank you, Maria, for your answer. Uh, now it's time for our next session on, on links between the reform project and the value chain after which there will be also uh, be some time for questions from the audience. So please use the, use the chat to send your questions. Please give our warm welcome to our first guest for this session, Dr. Marios Sofoclius, Technical Project Manager at the Head of Hard Hardware at the EBOS Technologies Limited. Marius was a special scientist as the University of Cyprus from 2016 until 2022, and is currently a visiting researcher at Tel Aviv University in the field of biosensors and the electronic instrumentation. He is also a member of the editorial advisory board of several journals and has published more than 45 journal and conferences papers in high impact journals and conferences and served as structure for IEEE sensors conference and other uh, highly prestigious conferences. Please, uh, Dr. Sophocleus, take the floor. Hi, everyone. Um... 
to share my screen. Good. So the session today was about the environmental impact that uh, uh, printed electronics can have, and I'll try to give a like a head-on comparison with conventional electronics as a, a big discussion in the industry for something that has been out in the in the field for I don't know more than about fifty years now, and something that it's a uh, it's new and it's growing. So there's always a debate whether which one is more sustainable, which one uh, is more beneficial to the user. So I'll just try to give a short comparison here. So taking it from the materials side and the manufacturing side, so uh, you're pretty sure the community knows pretty well that conductive inks can be up to 90%, 98% metal. So meaning that the waste of other uh, materials is pretty low. On the other hand, if you compare with, you know, the production of a single silicon wafer, then a single silicon wafer can be the size of, I don't know, about uh, 10 centimeters diameter. And for that wafer, you might need uh, up to 500 kilograms of silicon. It just adds up to the uh, point that Maria had before about uh, reaching the uh, the limit of uh, critically available materials, so that makes it uh, that's a, it's a it's a huge difference between what is actually happening now with conventional electronics and moving to something that is more uh, efficient in the production. So eventually, it's more sustainable. Additionally, for the manufacturing side, in terms of energy required to uh, to manufacture printed electronics, if we take roll uh, to roll uh, printing process, for example, then there's a comparison of about 99% more energy efficient than the typical um, uh, silicon fabrication um, uh, plant. Just a small number comparison. So if comparing roll to roll printing, it consumes about 0 0.05 kilowatt hours per meter square, while for silicon wafers is about 1,200 kilowatts. Uh, hours per meter square. So the difference, it's pretty uh, obvious. Now, moving into the energy efficiency of the devices developed using printed electronics or the, um, or the conventional electronics. For printed electronics, you can go to um, several milliwatts. If you go to high-end applications with conventional electronics, you can go up to megawatts. Of course, uh, this comparison might not be 100% fair because based on what we currently have and what is currently available in the market, uh, conventional electronics can be more reliable at this stage and they can provide better performances. But again, that comparison can be a bit misleading because you know conventional electronics have been out there for uh, several decades. Printed electronics is a new field that is emerging right now. Also, in terms of weight, there's obviously um, a significant decrease between uh, uh, what the printed electronics can do compared to the conventional electronics. Additionally, the, the printed electronics can go directly, can use um, the material that they will be used on. They can use that as a substrate. For example, the clothing that uh, was shown before by Maria. Uh, on the other hand, for conventional electronics, uh, there are several very specific substrates like silicon or um, germanium or other, other other substrate that you need to work on. In terms of waste reduction, which is pretty uh, important, and the printing processes can reach a utilization rates of more than 95%. However, if you go to uh, conventional electronics, this is one of the major issues that uh, the European Commission is uh, focusing on uh, finding ways to make the electronics more sustainable. And that is because uh, just a, an example in terms of uh, uh, waste. In 2019, the world generated approximately 53.6 million metric tons of electric waste, which only uh, about 17% was uh, properly collected and recycled. Uh, based on what we saw before from the uh, Previous presenters, you can see that uh, sustainability, recovery, biodegradability, it's one of the focus of printed electronics, which will definitely reduce the, the waste. 
Now moving to life cycle considerations, as we mentioned before, um, this is of course um, variant for the printed electronics depending on the materials you're using, but the usual uh, uh, lifespan can range from one to 10 years. For smartphones, for example, you get two to three years. Again, this comparison might not be entirely fair because there are actually uh, consumer electronics that can last several decades, but still as the time goes by and with the, uh, with the more circle actually decreasing the size of devices, it kind of decreases the lifespan of those uh, devices as well. Um, in terms of the chemical uses, then obviously uh, the inks that are being used for printed electronics, uh, again, due to the initiatives that are actually happening now for eco-friendly uh, materials, um, there's a, a much bigger range of materials that can be used for printed electronics com compared to conventional electronics, which require um, very specific fabrication um, facilities and very uh, specific uh, materials like, and, and toxic actually materials and hazardous materials like uh, arsenic or phosphine or other photoresistic chemicals. All right, so just to move a bit on the market trends, just to give an idea of what is expected by flexible electronics, we're currently, if we take the market size in 2021, we're talking about 26 billion um, uh, dollars USD uh, back in 2021, and was predicted that by 2030, that will grow to 63 billion. Of course, some key players, you can see Blue Spark Technologies, OLED Works, Samsung Electronics, Flex Enable. I'm pretty sure these are uh, pretty obvious and uh, well-known players. Uh, in terms of region, it's important to see that Europe, Asia, and uh, North America are essentially leading the whole market on flexible electronics. Um, if we look at the production and market sizes for the global electronics industry, then the, the actual values of the market, they, they have a, uh, a comparison of um, one order of magnitude greater. And that is uh, essentially based on, the, uh, on the, con the conventional electronics, but based on what we saw before of a, uh, a, a growth an annual growth of the uh, printed electronics of 10.3%, then uh, it is expected that, again, due to the more circle and other new regulations coming in with the sustainable electronics from the European Union, I, it is expected to see a significant increase on the printed electronics and sustainable electronics compared to the conventional electronics. Now, in terms of market needs, um, I think, most common applications for um, for printed electronics would uh, would go to screens, as we saw before. They can go on NFC tags. They can go on um, uh, imagers or cameras. They can also go on antennas in general or um, large area sensors, where you can essentially wearable uh, devices that they can monitor health or they can monitor um, other or environmental parameters, something that we uh, is also growing uh, interest. Okay, just to give also an idea on which sectors the these flexible electronics are looking into. I guess just to a comment here that uh, these values are actually coming from 2021, but um, uh, of course several other um, sectors are showing up uh, as the time goes by. But uh, I think the most Common one is automotive and healthcare. They are uh, consuming most of the uh, and energy. They are consuming most of the market on flexible electronics, and uh, that goes to flexible displays, batteries, sensors, and uh, flexible memories. This is from uh, my side. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Marius, for your very interesting presentation. So we will kind of skip the questions that you had because you yes. already answered in your fantastic presentation. And so we will move on to our next guest, which is Thanks. Klaus Hecker. Um, and then we may take some questions from you later on, Marius. 
So Klaus Hecker, Hecker he's the managing director of uh, OEA, Organic and Printed Electronics Association. The OEA is the leading international industry association for the printed electronics with more than 200 members worldwide, representing the entire value chain. He is also responsible for LOPEC, the International Exhibition uh, and Conference for Organic and Printed Electronics. Klaus joined VDMA in Frankfurt, Germany in 2003 as project manager for the planning of an OLED pilot production, where he was responsible for technology evaluation, research planning and public funding. So Klaus, before passing the word to you, I've, uh, we have some questions that you may, you will probably answer during your presentation. That, so what can you tell us about the offers of printed electronics when it comes to envision a sustainable future for our society? Yeah, Tatiana, um, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present here and answer your questions. Maybe a, a few words up front. You already, thank you already for the for the introduction um, of OEA here in a nutshell for those who, uh, who are not aware of us at the leading industry association here. We cover the entire value chain. Um, having members, including Alma Science, um, uh, be, being part of um, uh, of the OEA, um, with key activities like uh, networking, uh, doing the roadmap, providing uh, market and technology information and uh, advocacy, promoting and initiating uh, the call at the European Commission uh, on Circular Electronics was one uh, of our activities together with our Sustainability group, we have several special interest groups, a roadmap I mentioned where you find all the information on products, technologies uh, <clears throat> and applications and the sustainability group of, um, of OEA heavily supported uh, the start of this fund of the funding program, I think where also um, a reform is, is funded from. You also mentioned uh, briefly LOPEC. I would like to say if somebody wants to to see, uh, let's say, a real overview on the on the topic, um, come to LOPEC, submit uh, your uh, paper. The call for papers open this month, um, and <clears throat> yeah, we provide with Mass Munich here the leading conference um, <clears throat> in the world for the for flexible and printed electronics. But now to your to your question, <clears throat> I mean. Sustainability and the advantages uh, that can be derived for the industry have several different aspects. Uh, we already heard some of them uh, in other presentations here. Uh, production uh, advantages in production is is one is one thing. Uh, the new technological approaches, um, uh, yeah, are really the are the basis for for significantly um, increasing the efficiency um, uh, of energy, and but also on using less materials so resource um, efficiency. And um, we thought that we have a heavily reduced energy consumption if we use additive processes, in particular printing processes. Um, <clears throat> these te uh, these technology or these processes are low temperature processes uh, we are usually uh, with printing we are at room temperature with uh, all the different steps we we stay uh, at 100 or 120 degrees this saves a lot of energy in general we don't need vacuum or clean rooms or let's say high class clean rooms as we know it from, from um, <clears throat> traditional semiconductors um, <clears throat> other processes like uh, um, replacing solder process and uh, new drying processes in, in addition, reduce the energy consumption. If we look on the materials, um, we have no hazardous materials uh, that um, that helps here the, the industry. Uh, also, no hazardous process materials in, in, in general. Um, <clears throat> and these new materials enable it more or less, not a total, but a high degree of freedom in design, as you see here, three dimensional. Uh, curved or even even more complex uh, structures that you can that you can do with these new materials. This enables new applications, new products. I will show on, on the next slide. Um, and uh, things have a much simpler structure. If you look on displays, yeah, and all the displays has only uh, <clears throat> let's say five six layers, um, whereas an LCD, a classical um, 
uh, liquid crystal display <clears throat> has more than, du than double of the number of the layers, which is, yeah, more, um, <clears throat> more material, more process sets, more energy. And so um, a printed electronics can, can largely reduce um, the energy consumption. And last but not least, of course, uh, the devices um, <clears throat> we already um, uh, mentioned the, the advantage in producing things, but having lightweight products, uh, you see uh, um, uh, organic photovoltaic cell that are really just a, a film, a flexible film, um, or looking on sensor surfaces, human machine interfaces, and that can be used in or largely used now in automotive or <clears throat> wide good applications, replacing a lot of mechanical switches and connections and uh, <clears throat> and relatively complex mechanical devices, reducing it to one um, injector molded plastic part with with touch functions and maybe light included. Um, this is a heavy reduction of of, of the amount of material. Um, uh, reducing the weight by by a factor of four or five in many cases, and and, and also an increased lifetime. Um, this yeah shows and is just another example um, how to to benefit from these uh, <coughs> properties of of the technology and the and the materials. Um, Photovoltaics and energy generation has been mentioned um, earlier. It's always a question also with the efficiencies and things like that. But if we look on the, for example, on the energy payback time, so if you look how much energy do I have to put in um, to make a, a, a solar cell and <clears throat> how long does it take under, let's say, normal uh, sun conditions uh, to generate the energy that I put in uh, before in the, in the production, um, here we have a, um, a very short energy payback time of about six months um, with OPV, which is much, <clears throat> much better than silicon uh, solar cells, which, <clears throat> uh, which have a higher efficiency, but also need much more energy um, in, the, in the production. So this is from a, yeah, let's say process, material and uh, device uh, product perspective. Uh, <clears throat> how we can contribute here to to <clears throat> sustainable um, electronics. Thank you, Klaus, for your presentation. Last but not least for this session, please give a very warm welcome to Anti Kilia. Anti is a serial entrepreneur and has degrees in engineering and in business. He spent a number of years at CERN building industry academia collaboration and raised funds for such projects. Currently, he is running Accelerate Venture Builder that focuses on disruptive innovations in life science domain. At Accelerate, Anti leads a team of 10 experts and is working towards raising his own investment fund. As part of this strategy, he now coordinates deep tech investment action that injects pre-seed funds to 32 promising startups. Klaus, uh, I have a couple of questions uh, for you. Can you elaborate more on the investment program you are doing. It is for printing electronics? Um, I, I guess this uh, question was for me, right? Yes, brilliant. Yeah. Yes. Um, currently, we have the investment program, which is um, focusing on deep tech startups. So we are really looking for new solutions which are accessing the challenges that Europe is having. So as such, it's not dedicated to printed electronics, but printed electronics could be one of the uh, technologies that can, can be used for solving these challenges that Europe is facing. But uh, another question, how do you see the private investments in the field will evolve? 
Yeah, so this is a very big question and it all all depends who is asking and how do we focus on on raising these funds. So if if we think about um the mass manufacturing uh, currently the printed printed electronics is growing in the Asian and Pacific area. So I believe the biggest investments will be happening there. But if we are talking about new technologies, advanced manufacturing technologies, then Europe is in very good uh, position because it's it's dominating this area. So um, uh, the digitalization is one of the uh, trends which is taking um, uh, the the investments at the moment. So um, I believe that in advanced manufacturing there are plenty of public funds for for starters. And then the venture capitalists will follow because half of the advanced manufacturing companies are actually backed by um, uh, usually some some type of uh, investment. And especially the, the VC venture capitalist investments are big in this area. So they will follow. Um, but I believe uh, European Commission will first lead this trend. Let me go. All right. So um, I'm Antti Heikkilä. I'm the CEO of Accelerate Venture Builder. And we are commercializing disrupt innovations, especially in the life science field. And our approach is that we take the responsibility of the actual commercialization where the uh, researcher and the innovator, they can con concentrate on the core technology or, or the research. And we accept quite low technology readiness level innovations to our pipeline. And uh, we basically do all the all the required actions to establish operations and business and, and even growth. Uh, from the technology domain, uh, deep tech is of very much interest. And as we are building our own fund, um, we have now embarked on a road together with European Innovation Council, actually, where we established uh, Ventures Thrive, which is a growth and investment program. So we are giving um, 30, uh, 32 companies uh, uh, small injections, uh, around 80K for, for 16 companies. And then during this program, we try to leverage these funds by finding additional funds, even like 10 times more, but that's a very ambitious plan. And now those companies who are having some, some deep tech um, in their uh, portfolio and really would like to use it, we are launching the second call in October. And you should definitely visit, visit the uh, website of VenturesTribe.eu to, to follow and take part when the call is really launched. So regarding the investment trends, um, I asked actually uh, our team to support support me to create this um, presentation. And we started looking at what is happening in the innovation area. And the EU is very much lacking behind. As we all know, we do not have too many patents in the print ele printed electronics area. Everybody else looks to be going fast. But also here we have a little bit of, of increasing trend. So that, that looks already promising. Uh, <clears throat> the EU has really understood this gap. And I think the first milestone uh, was reached 2018, where there were recommendations that this printed electronics value chain and also the manufacturing capacities should be improved. When we are looking at uh, the European area type of funds, we have to understand two different angles. So first of all, we have the regional development angle, and then we have really the strategic R&D technology development angle. So in the regional development approach, job creation, industry competitiveness, all these are very much 
um, on on top. And here, the funding really comes from the um, uh, local regional development agencies, ministries. And uh, lately, the digitalization has been one of the trends here. And also, of course, resource efficiency, all the green values, of course, are driving this one as well. When we are going to the R&D side, uh, we have to start talking about strategic objectives so that there is a technological sovereignty and uh, and access to um, uh, good and advanced materials, and especially the supply chains, the flexibility of, of these ones is of importance. And there are a number of policies, strategies, acts, agendas, which somehow align with the printed electronics. So uh, those ones who are thinking of applying funds from the public sources should really try to see what is happening and following uh, the uh, calls as well. Um, when we are going deeper into the strategic areas, um, I would say printed electronics is part of the key enabling technologies. It really enables the um, manufacturing and especially advanced manufacturing to uh, prosper. And this advanced manufacturing area is very important for Europe. So it's currently, uh, Europe is dominating this market, this industrial engineering mar market together with China. And if we've tried to think who would be really using this technology and also possibly investing into this technology, uh, we always come, come down to automotive industry. And as we have heard in the uh, previous presentations, consumer electronics, healthcare, smart packaging, and even aerospace is um, one of these industry areas. So EU is supporting uh, research and innovation in the advanced manufacturing area. And the reason is that basically there are 2 million enterprises who are employing th almost 30 million people. And this area is really creating lots of economic impact and these guys are also putting lots of effort on research and innovation and they are they are spending money themselves already into the uh, activities so all in all europe is very strong in the advanced manufacturing technologies and basically this has resulted to the highest share of world patent applications and then the highest number of venture capitalist backed firms as well, which is super exciting. So we have learned that the um, market is growing. So it also means that the venture capitalists will follow this market. However, as we now know, the venture capitalist market hasn't been doing very well recently. So there has been a global uh, downturn in the investments. And um, during the last quarter, the, the first quarter of, of this year, we saw the deals drop heavily. But basically, the situation is not this bad because of these deals, half went to the um, very early phase startups. So that basically means that um, the investment companies are really believing into this area and that's why they are investing into the startups if you think about okay what should i look at next if i want to have funding then we all know horizon europe is there it has lots of billions to share but there are others as well but i just collected a couple of things here um to, to highlight that, okay, there are a number of things that one, one should take a look at. Made in, in Europe, which is um, the next step of the factories of, of the future. It's a uh, co-investment program by the European Commission, and it's a public-private partnership. There is a uh, 1.8 billion for 
activities which are really in the manufacturing area. Then the Chips for Europe initiative, which is very strategic um, act and an initiative as well. And it's providing lots of funding for research and designing, design and manufacturing capacities. EID manufacturing strategic agenda is one of the um, quite interesting areas. And it's um, interesting in, in that sense that it also works very close with the industrial players. So it's easier to form collaborations with such actor. And then finally, if you really want to take a look at uh, Horizon Europe, what is happening between 2023 and 24, uh, there are a couple of things that quickly I, I found. Uh, the cluster four, which is basically focusing on resource efficiency, can be something that printed printed electronics could be addressing. Uh, then there are advanced biomaterials for the healthcare. And then finally, also the research infrastructure uh, and their services to enhance uh, EU's capacity for the development of semiconductors is probably very close with the printed electronics. So we can continue the discussion. Uh, my details are here. Or if you have any, any questions, then feel free. Thank you, Enti, and all the speakers of this session for uh, your very nice presentations and insights. We are running a bit late, so we need to move on for our next session of the day, uh, which is the um, impact of performance sister project mothers and impress me on printed electronics. So for starting, we are going to uh, pass the floor to Dr. Yolanda Alessanko, which is the consortial uh, leader of our reform project. Yolanda has been a researcher in CD Tech for more than 15 years, particularly in the area of uh, nanosurface. And her current scientific activity involves the development of printed electronics and functional materials and formulations. Over the years, she has participated in different national, regional, and European uh, research projects. So, Yolanda, just to to kickstart, how can we make printed electronics more sustainable by working from design? Okay, um, it's uh, very important uh, when uh, we are thinking on uh, on a product. Um, uh, we should take into account that more than 80% uh, of the environmental impact uh, of a product is uh, determined at the design stage. So uh, with designing a, a device, uh, we must start from the concept uh, design for recyclability. So um, these products uh, should be designed in a way that um, all materials that are in use uh, can be uh, recycled uh, or may, may can be um, retained in the highest possible qualities uh, to be uh, uh, to maximize the reuse, and also uh, to fix um, while well, fixing some valuable components such as PCBs, um, batteries, and uh, micro microchips, and so on. Uh, we must uh, must avoid permanent fixing. So. Um, you should use a reversible, reversible uh, fixing instead. So uh, like a press feet or a, um, a adhesive that allow the removal, for example. Yeah. So this is a good point because it's, it's really important to, to start uh, from the design of the product, the product of the device from uh, taking into account the eco design principles. Yeah, so. <laughs> thank you. So, um, I will uh, start with my with my presentation of today. So, okay. So um, let's contextualize in the project. Uh, we can say that uh, two keywords of the project uh, can be uh, functional electronics and sustainability. So uh, functional electronics that comprises uh, nano electronics, smart system, flexible organic and printed electronics exceeds um, multiple uh, opportunities. So uh, it's estimated that the global uh, market for the printed uh, organic and flexible electronics will grow to 74 billion in 2030. But this uh, opportunities may be treated by the environmental and resource impact of the electronic devices themselves. 
uh, the increasing demand of electronics uh, and ever shorter product life cycles uh, lead to the generation of um, more and more electronic waste. Uh, it is considered that um, um, one of the fastest uh, growing waste stream with um, 54, around 54 million metric tons of electric waste generated around 2019, as uh, advanced by, by Marios in uh, his uh, presentation. While only around uh, uh, 20 percent of the electronic waste is assumed to be uh, formally uh, recycled. Uh, Europe ranks first in the world in terms of electrical and electronic waste generation per capita with more than uh, 15 kilograms of uh, electronic waste generated by every person in uh, 2019. Um, how, uh, therefore, if uh, Europe is going to take the global lead in uh, functional electronics, uh, we must uh, also ensure that functional electronics do not become the electronic waste problem of the future. So moving to the, the next uh, slide. Okay. Uh, with this idea uh, arises the reform project. The reform project aims to address the environmental and sustainability challenges around conventional uh, functional electronics. It uh, seeks to use eco-design principles to ensure that uh, functional electronics can be produced in a way that uh, meet the requirements of uh, multiple high-performance applications, uh, while also meeting societal and environmental needs for sustainability. The consortium led by, uh, led by CDTEC brings together uh, 12 uh, partners, including academics, uh, non-profit RTOs, and SME partners from eight uh, countries across, across Europe. And um, it is, uh, well, uh, will, will be delivered in, uh, in 42 months. It started in, in January, 2023. Moving on the next uh, slide. So uh, the main objectives of the uh, project include, include the development of um, environment, environmentally benign electronic building blocks, focusing on green biodrive conductive, conductive inks, flexible substrates and, and adhesives. And uh, then these uh, building blocks uh, are integrated into industry-led a functional electronic systems supported by uh, innovation and, and conformance testing and material recovery methods. Specifically, reform is uh, developing uh, fully organic conductive inks uh, and cellulose-based electrolytes, also cellulose-based substrates and recyclable thermosets composites uh, to be employed as uh, flexible substrates and uh, the vulnerable uh, adhesives to allow uh, the removal of non-printed uh, iridized electronic components. So uh, all these uh, materials uh, will be employed to develop uh, different uh, devices, uh, such as uh, metal-free on paper micro supercapacitors, RFID tags for smart logistics, and embedded pressure vessel sensors. So is this a briefly, uh, the um, <clears throat> a general overview of the of the project. Uh, if you have any any question, uh, of course, uh, you can send a, a, an email, and uh, I will do my best to to uh, uh, support yourself. So, so your your uh, inquiries. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Yolanda, for your presentation. Moving to our next guest, Laura Gomez -E Lopez Mir coordinator of Madras Project, which is an Innovation Action Horizon 2020 project. Laura has been a researcher at the Unity of Functional Printing and em Embedded Devices in Eurecat since 2018. She has 10 years of experience in material science, especially on oxide and organic electronics from fabrication and characterization of thin films to device manufacturing. At the present time, she does research centered in the fabrication of optoelectronic devices like solar cells, 
by printing techniques and in device plastic integration by means of in mouth electronics. I have a, a couple of a, a couple of questions right. before uh, if you go to your presentation. What are the the key advantages of in mouth electronics in these particular cases? So um, in mouth electronics is is uh, presented as a, a manufacturing approach that can lead to printed products to mass production. Uh, printed products that are embedded in, in plastics, um, and also you can uh, you can obtain products that that are three D shaped and integrated in in more complex forms than the ones that you obtain with just um, flexible substrates. Mm, okay, and other question among the outcomes of the Madras project, which ones have the highest potential? Uh, for uh, future exploitation. Yeah, so for example, I will explain you now in a few minutes in Madras project, we have demonstrated that we can inject more organic solar cells and these have a wide range of exploitation. So you, uh, for example, uh, you can you can integrate uh, solar cells in plastic pieces and now with the advent of, for example, in indoor OPVs, you could imagine that you can integrate um, solar cells into sockets or into, into consumer electronic products very easily and having hidden connectors or, uh, or freedom of shape, as I said before. Thank you, Laura, for your answers. And, and now, please go ahead with your presentation. Yeah. I, 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 it's just two slides. I, I try to, to be fast as I have five minutes and I think we're running um, out of time. And so Madras project is a project that finishes in, in this last June. And it's the goal of the project is to demonstrate a manufacturing approach in the framework of Imol Electronics for the production of innovative restaurant products. And we, this approach is material driven. So we have partners that have developed advanced materials like nanosolar substrates and conducting and semiconducting inks based on nanowires and nanoparticles on pilot and tanks and oxide. Uh, these materials have been developed by partners as Genesync, um, University of Pardubice, or Arthur Wiggins, that now is Ferdigoni. Um, these materials have been designed to withstand uh, injection molding processes like thermoforming and, and injection molding, and have been applied in, in devices that are not the common ones where, where you find uh, in one electronics applied to, that, that normally are, are LEDs. Or, or hybridized uh, or, or capacitive sensors. In, in our case, we apply in mole electronics to active devices as antennas, uh, and photodetectors, and solar cells. And, and we, we use these devices to build three demonstrators. One, it's a, a smart flexible tag for the geolocation of assets developed by, by Uinlog, a biometric fingerprint sensor. And that, that it's meant to be applying to a scooters for a sharing motor company developed by Chieno and, and, and applied to motor bikes from Ultra and the in more solar modules developed by, by, by Infinity PV and, and intermoded by Eureka that are used to demonstrate the upscalability of the manufacturing process. Um, I will center to the, to, to the most, the, the two successful cases. Which is the the, the tag and the uh, the OPV module. So, the, the for the tag, the innovative uh, in, in the important innovation of this tag is that it's it's battery free thanks to the implementation of a radio frequency energy harvesting system developed by you know. Um, the the this technology requires complex integrated circuits, and this these integrated circuits cannot. Uh, at this point being um, printed, so they are embedded in a PCB. And in Madras, we have developed an approach to hybridize the PCB onto a flexible substrate where the antennas, are, uh, a, a combination of ultra high frequency and ultra wide antenna um, complex conjugate, uh, printed over a flexible subject that in this case, it's nanocellulose. So we also try to do these products more sustainable. And, and these um, antennas with the, with the integrated PCB are 
embedded in a plastic piece through injection molding and in, are embedded in a, in a flexible plastic piece using TPU. And also the, the, the EMOL OPV modules uh, are made with the materials developed by some partners. So they include silver nanowires and pitot based inks. Um, they are produced in a, in a road to road facility at Infinity PV. And we have demonstrated that we can inject mold them also with TPU and that all the mod um, uh, we had a 90% of, of yield of functional mo modules and we have also demonstrated that we don't have any loss of performance uh, upon injection. Okay, uh, these are the, the most successful results, but in Madras we have also worked um, as I explained you in the last, in the last um, this slide on novel and conducting inks that uh, are fit for animal electronics on nanocellulose based substrates and uh, on animal encapsulation of PCBs on printed circuits, on applying animal electronics on tags, so on embedded antennas, on achieving 3D shape for the sensing images that I don't have time to explain in here, and applying animal electronics to um, solar cells, to organic solar cells. Yeah. That's all for me, um, and thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I think. Thank you, Laura. Um, so we will move on to the next speaker as we are a bit uh, yeah. late on time. If we have time, we come back for questions. Yeah. So now we welcome to the stage Dr. Jule Forstrom. She is a principal scientist in the research area of biomass processing and products at VTT. She holds a Doctor of Science Technology degree from the Forest Products Department in Finland. Tula has managed and coordinated several EU projects and currently coordinates the EU Impress Me Open Innovation Testbed project that will offer commercial pilot services to scale lab results to proof of concept. Tula, before moving on to your presentation, and maybe you will address it later on, but just a quick question on the sensitive uh, issue. <laughs> so who owns the foreground and IP from the projects done during the, the use of the open, the open test beds um, services? So, yes, thank you for the question. So um, I, I come from a VTT and I, I work as a coordinator of the project and, and this is really a big project where we have developed our pilot facilities and everything, of course, what we do during the project, uh, so who does the work, owns the, the results, uh, so foreground. But uh, after this project, uh, the, the services will be available uh, on commercial places. And then, of course, the customer uh, owns the results when they pay the, the price for the, for the using the pilot facilities. And uh, then depending on if the customer brings the idea inside, of course, they own that as well. But if they use our, our IP, of course, then it's a negotiation about, uh, about who owns the IP. Uh, my contact details are here, and I try to explain you how we can help you uh, to take uh, uh, maybe unconventional directions. So a couple of words about uh, the test beds in general first. So commission is, is funding uh, over 40 uh, open innovation test beds, which are owning uh, big pilots and also other, so, uh, so, uh, also having a lot of other research uh, activities, uh, these and laboratories. And the main aim is to is, is develop a, a open innovation test bed to support European companies to scale up their, nano, uh, their, their, their processes and, and materials to a higher, higher uh, TRL level. So to reach the TRL 7, so that we really are making some impact and, and generating jobs in the industry. Uh, this uh, EU project that I present now is impress me and here we focus on bio-based materials and we try to to in a way generate solutions where we have as little fossil based uh, based materials as possible so this is the main concept about the test beds what i just explained so we have 16 um, pilot lines uh, that um, uh, 
we can use for processing materials and also making the final applications. And we validate them in a project with the test cases. And now I introduce you one of the test cases, uh, which is the, uh, the a smart label for packaging. And uh, this is a, 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 a solution that is, is, um, uh, is printed uh, on, on, on paper. And uh, there we use bio-based nanoparticles, um, uh, both the cellulose nanofibrils and cellulose nanocrystals in inks. And then we um, use these inks uh, uh, different and into other different kind of materials to make an electrochromic display, battery, and then humidity sensor. And these we are doing with our, uh, our partners' um, pilot lines, which are that sort of um, large-scale pilots. Uh, and, and the printing is in, in from sheet to sheet uh, facilities. Then we have an industrial partner uh, in, a, in a project who is actually taking this to the next step. Uh, so using the, uh, the roll to roll printing so that, uh, that um, these uh, developments will be scaled up to a uh, full production scale. Uh, in this case, uh, it, it's our par Italian par or partner or the Actually, facilities are located in, in France, Ferdicioni, and uh, they include these new features to the, to the label. And besides them, they will uh, have a, a NFC chip there and also an antenna to make it uh, an active uh, smart label. And this is just an example to explain to you that if you, if uh, the, the, uh, industrial partners, or then uh, small companies don't have facilities to do uh, the upscaling themselves. They can use these test beds uh, that um, uh, European Commission has has funded. And in in uh, in Impress Me uh, Open Innovation Test Bed, we have several bio-based material test uh, that sort of pilot facilities, and then printing electronic facilities. Uh, in sheet to sheet form, and but if uh, this final scaling up needs uh, that sort of um, larger scale um, productions on roll to roll, then there is two other pi uh, test beds uh, that uh, are already um, offering the services or have just started and will offer later on services. Flex function sustain is soon to to. To be function uh, to to be ready and and offer the services uh, and then convert to green uh, will uh, has just started and will serve later on the services uh, to to anyone who is willing to use the big pilots. So we are not talking about the the research so much, but really help for for scaling up the things. And these are located in in. Uh, um, in um, in uh, in several countries in 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 uh, Europe and doing cooperation with the other partners so that you know, jointly we can then then uh, offer a certain uh, solu solution for for the company. Thank you. This is all what I had to, to explain. So if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer. There were some questions that have been asked. Ah, there is a, a question from Duncan. What kind of read range do you achieve? Pardon? What kind of read range do you achieve? But I'm not sure. I don't understand maybe the question. Maybe so that for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So in general, I think that most of the partners who are actually having these pilot facilities are already in a printed intelligence, uh, that sort of uh, the communities. Uh, but uh, the specialty what we have in testbed is that in a way we are working together and make uh, that sort of single entry point offers uh, offers for the customers uh, through the single entry points. Okay. Thank you. So we are a bit late. So I think that we can close the session. Uh, Juan, some final words? Just so, okay. 
thank you for the attendees and the speakers uh, for the, your for sharing your experiences and questions. Um, and please do remember we have the printed electronic silics where you have uh, projects and project uh, collaboration opportunities and where you can find co-workers. So thank you very much, Juan. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Yeah, from the okay. Catholic side as well. Thank you very much, Tatiana thank and you. Juan, for your facilitation and to all our great speakers who um, had joined us today. And of course, to everyone who attended today's event. Thank you very much and have a lovely day. Thank you.